Good morning, YouTube family. Uh, thank you guys so much for being here. If you've subscribed, I'm really, really happy that you decided to join me. If you're new here, please go ahead and subscribe and join us. You're gonna find makeup on this channel, but you're also gonna find history, book reviews. We're gonna talk about history and movies. It's not gonna be your average beauty YouTube channel because I'm not a beauty YouTuber. I'm not a beauty influencer. I have paid for every single one of my products because I do not get anything for free, me, right? So if you're new here or you don't follow me on social media, which I'll link below, my name is Jamie. My professional name is Dr. Jamie Goodall. Most of my students and colleagues call me Dr. G. And yeah, uh, if you're interested in how I put together this very bold lip but fairly neutral eye and you wanna hear my incredibly rambly introduction, then just keep watching. Yeah, so I just figured for this first video, since it's uh, on the quicker end of getting ready, that I would just tell you who I am, a little bit about myself, and just sort of why I started this channel. Um, before I started filming, I primed my skin with this Neutrogena Healthy Skin Primer. I'm still testing it out, but I think so far that I really like it. Uh, one of the things uh, that stand out about this particular one is that it has SPF in it. A little bit about me currently. I teach in the public history department at Stevenson University, where I have the best students ever. Don't don't come for me. I'm gonna put some CoverGirl True Blend Matte Made Foundation on. This unfortunately does not appear to have SPF in it, but that's okay because I'm gonna be inside all day. And I have the color L20 Light Ivory. I already wet my beauty sponge. Uh, you know your girl cannot afford a $20 beauty blender, so. We're gonna work with what we have. I think this one is from Real Techniques. But yeah, so I got my PhD from The Ohio State. Uh, technically, I officially got it in 2016, uh, but I had started my job, I'm very fortunate to have started my job at Stevenson while I was still ABD, um, with the understanding, of course, that I would finish within that year, and I did, thankfully. I think part of the reason that I ended up at Stevenson is because I have a pretty mixed background. My undergraduate degree from Appalachian State University was in archaeology with a minor concentration in history. And I loved doing archaeology. Uh, it was a lot of fun, but um, I realized when I did the required dig that it was not something that was sustainable for me physically. During the required dig, we we're working on a indigenous site on the Biltmore State in North Carolina, and I herniated three discs in my back the very first week. So I was like, well, that's probably not the best idea. But by that point, I was a little far into the program and just decided to stick with it because I enjoyed it. And I was like, well, who knows? Something else may come along that I can use this degree for. As part of my electives, I took the museum management course, I think was the first one I took, and I really enjoyed that. Uh, I think mostly I just really liked working with uh, Dr. Charles Watkins, who ran the program at the time. And so then I took another of the museum classes that he offered to the undergraduates, and I was hooked. I was like, well, I always loved museums. Why not just see where this can take me? And it was awesome, but when I went to do the required internship, it was sort of the same story. I did an internship at a small historical society in Brownsville, Texas. And for anybody who's thinking about pursuing public history, chances are you're going to be working in a small venue. So I got there and the woman in charge of my internship, she was relatively new to the organization and she was the curator of their new exhibition space that they had received from the city, uh, right on the border with Mexico. It was an amazing area. And she was like, well, I, ha I don't really have archival experience. I could use somebody to do archiving work. Why don't you do your internship in the archives? And I was like, oh, that sounds great. So I'm putting on ColourPop's no filter concealer. What I love about ColourPop is that, at least for me, I find that the vast majority of their products work. 
uh, and they are affordable. I think this concealer is like $6 and I am the shade Fair 4. Might be a little light for me, but I like some brightening under the eyes since, you know, now that I'm getting older, the dark circles get bigger and bigger and darker and darker. But back to the museums. So she gave me a list of things to do uh, on my first day there. And I was like, all right, cool. So it was things like scanning images, relabeling folders, because in the move, whoever had worked there prior, and it had been some time since they had an archivist, things got really mixed up. They weren't accessioned into their systems properly. Uh, new things had been added that never got accessioned. They had actually just switched accessioning software. And so it was just a big mess. And she just didn't know quite how to tackle all of it and work on the curation side of things. So I was like, doing all of that. And at the end of my first day, I worked there from usually 8.30 in the morning till about 5, 4.35 PM each day. And I came to her and I was like, Hey, finish the list for today. Can't wait to see what you have for me tomorrow. And she just sort of looked at me. She was very concerned and she was like, what? And I was like, yeah, I, I finished the list. I'm going to go ahead and head back. I was staying with my grandparents and they lived about an hour away. And she was like, um, that list was your internship for the next eight weeks. And I was like, Ooh, and she was like, yeah, clearly I've never had an intern before. And I was like, well, clearly I've never been an intern before. Cause I did not realize that. And the more work that I did, sorry, public history students, I love you guys, but archives just wasn't for me. I, I really enjoyed working with the material, but it was just something I couldn't see myself doing long time. So I had a bit of a, a crisis because here I came from a blue collar, sort of more low income working family. I was the first student in my entire family to go to college. Um, I was the first person in my family to go beyond an undergraduate degree. And I think as of right now, my brothers are still, they're working on their degrees. So I'm really proud of them. It doesn't matter as long as you're working towards it. Um, but I'm the first person to go on to grad school. I'm the first person to get a master's degree and a PhD. So I had no idea what I was doing. I was just sort of making shit up as I went. I also had this really naive idea about the academy, uh, just because coming from a, a lower class working family where my dad and my mom each would routinely work well over 40 hours a week and they were never home. And when they were home, they were always tired. I just, you know, I was like, Oh, being a professor must be so amazing. They must make so much money because I was like, how could you not make money working at a university? Whoops. And so I was talking with one of my mentors, Dr. Sheila Phipps from App State, and that was just the flower powder from Beauty Bakery. If you have not checked out this company, you definitely need to go do that right now. It is a company owned by a startup black woman who got tired as she should of the beauty industry, not taking the needs of women of color, especially black women, seriously. So I absolutely love her products. They're top quality, but I was talking to my mentor and she was like, well, what is it that you enjoyed about working here on your masters? She was like, obviously the public history stuff was good for you, but you're just not sure that it's right. And I was like, well, I think my favorite aspect was being able to work as a teaching associate, helping the instructors out, and working with students. Uh, in particular, I loved working with students. And actually, I still have one of my former undergrad students who she still keeps in contact with me. And I love just seeing what's going on in her life. And so my mentor was like, well, why don't you go to grad school for a PhD? And then you could get into teaching. And I was like, huh. This is so perfect. Archaeology, museum studies, history. We'll just, you know, we'll just tick off all the boxes. So again, coming from a blue collar background, I had no idea the ins and outs of applying to grad school, how ridiculously expensive it was. I racked up 
more credit card debt than I should have, putting in applications, taking the GRE, doing all of these things. That blush was Milani Powder Blush in Romantic Rose. Uh, I really like this for a subtle look. And I just, I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> no idea what I was doing. I threw out all of these applications. I applied to UNC Greensboro, UNC Charlotte, UNC Chapel Hill, uh, Auburn. I mean, I was just throwing out applications everywhere in the, the Southeast because that's where I grew up, North Carolina. I spent a lot of time in Virginia when my dad was in the Navy and that was where I was comfortable. And then the rejections started to come, which was a new experience for me because when I was an undergrad, I applied to one school and I was very fortunate that I got into the one school that I applied to. And I was like, shit, well, if I'm getting rejected from all of these places, what, what do I do? Because I had no career plan. I had no idea what to do after graduation. Uh, I had sort of bypassed a lot of my peers in that I graduated undergrad in three years trying to save myself on student loan debt. And here I was getting rejected. So um, don't do what I did. All right. But this worked out for me, thankfully. A lot of things have worked out for me that I would never recommend. But I was dating a guy at the time. This was before I met my husband. And he was from Ohio. And I was like, you know what? I never even considered Ohio. Let's apply to Ohio University and Ohio State University. And my friends were like, you are absolutely batshit insane. Do, do you honestly think a, a bumpkin girl from North Carolina is going to get into Ohio State? And I was like, well, I knew nothing about Ohio State. I didn't know that it was a top tier R1 school. And I was like, whatever, it'll be fine. Uh, this was Milani Strobe Light Afterglow. Really nice, subtle highlight as well. Very affordable at Target and Walmart. I tend to do my face first before doing eyes and stuff, unless I'm doing something really dramatic uh, with my eyes and I'm worried about fallout. So there I was waiting to hear back. And lo and behold, I got an acceptance letter from Ohio State, Ohio University, and Auburn. Auburn couldn't guarantee me funding until year three, and I said, nope, can't, can't afford that. And Ohio University was gorgeous. I loved visiting there, but they really wanted me to focus my PhD research on women's studies, which was not something I was interested in at the time, despite having an awesome women's history class with Dr. Phipps. And when I spoke with who would have become my advisor at Ohio State, she was like, well, what are the things that you're interested in? And I was like, well, I wrote this paper for my imperialism class on piracy. That's something that I'm really into. She was like, done. If that's what you want to do, let's do it. And I was really happy that she was so supportive of what I was trying to do. So she worked to get me funding. Uh, I got guaranteed funding for at least four years with the uh, option of having a fifth year of funding if I proved my need, which she figured wouldn't be a big deal given my background. And off to Ohio State I went. So I'm going to do some bronzer from Wet n Wild. This is from their Fire Dragon versus Ice Dragon collection in the shade Your Dragon Me Down. Uh -huh. I love a good pun, so that's, that's nice. But this collection really is just essentially a Game of Thrones collection and very, very affordable if you've never used Wet n Wild before. And has their formulas come a long way? Yes, they're amazing. So went to Ohio State, did all the things you were supposed to do, although as great as my advisor was in so many ways, I think it was hard for her to understand where I was coming from. The things that she assumed I already knew but didn't, uh, Things like applying for grants and fellowships and, you know, timetables for dissertation and defending and all these things. I just, and I didn't have the language for it either. I didn't, I didn't know what a lot of the terms meant that people were throwing out. And thank God for some of my colleagues like Emily Arndt and Mark Boonshoff and Cam Shriver because that they came in at the same time I did. We were sort of this large early American cohort that year and they really helped me keep it together. And so yeah, I, my doctoral work on piracy and 
here I am. I try to infuse a lot of that into my classrooms, just helping the students figure out what works for them. Right now, one of my advisees, Anthony, he is one of our public history majors. He's a junior, and so he's thinking about internship, post-graduation plans, and trying to help him understand that his public history degree can take him pretty much anywhere. He is very much into affecting change through social justice, and I'm really supportive of that. I want him to take his public history work and really transform that into a meaningful experience. And so if anybody out there at social justice organizations, hey ACLU, if you're looking for somebody pretty awesome, you should reach out to Anthony. I can give you all his contact info. Um, he's such a hard worker. All of our students are really hard workers. So yeah. What else to tell you about myself? Uh, well, first of all, I have a crooked face, so this is fun. But right now, this semester, I'm teaching early American history. I have two sections of that. Uh, that's sort of typical. I've taught modern U.S. survey here before, but given my specialties in early America, Atlantic world, particularly the early modern period, uh, my department chair tends to give me the or modern world history survey, which goes from 1500 to present, and then gives me the early America survey, which goes from pre-contact. Uh, I think technically it's supposed to start in 1492, but I do not start in 1492. I always talk about indigenous experiences first, and then goes to 1877. And I recognize the challenges that so many of my students face in terms of being prepared for academic life uh, because the student population has changed and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that student population changing. So many of them are coming from backgrounds very similar to mine. They don't know how to navigate resources. They don't know how to ask questions. So when you say, hey, does anybody have any questions? If they don't know how to ask the question, if they don't know how to express vulnerability, that can be really difficult. Um, so I try to build in a lot of scaffolding ways in which they can be vulnerable with me that aren't going to hurt them. One of the things that enables me to do that is that I have the privilege, the ability um, to express some of my own vulnerabilities. It's difficult as a woman, but being, you know, having the white privilege, I have that ability more so than my colleagues of color, especially women of color, and I recognize that privilege and so it's something that I think needs to change in academia because one of the things that can help you connect with students uh, is being a little bit more vulnerable, uh, being able to admit when you don't know something or n don't know how to pronounce something and work together to find the information uh, or to, you know, my students know uh, all about my bipolar 2 disorder. I don't hide that from them because so many of them are struggling with mental health disorders. Some of them don't realize that that's what they're struggling with. So many of them are dealing with family issues, relationship problems. Uh, for many of them, it's their first time being away from home uh, for any amount of time. Uh, most of my students are working at least one, if not multiple jobs to try to get through college. And so by being more vulnerable and open about those issues, my students have developed a trust with me that I, again, I recognize the privilege of being able to do that. They don't lie to me. I have so many professor friends who are like, I just, I know that this student is lying. Like the worst of course is, well, how many times can a grandma die in a semester? And that one always irks me. Uh, so I just drew on some brows because my, uh, brows are rather light with Anastasia Brow Wiz in chocolate. Uh, this is the narrow pen. I build in mental health days into my syllabus because if students need a mental health day, they need a mental health day. They're not going to have an excuse, you know, they're not going to have doctor's notes or anything like that. And you know what? If a student tells me they're sick, they're sick. Most of them can't afford to go to the doctor. Our wellness center is really backed up, and most of the time our wellness center doesn't give notes. 
if a student says that a family member or a loved one has died, I'm going to believe them. I don't, you know, if I go into the classroom with a sense of distrust, then my students aren't going to trust me either. And that's one of the major things for me is developing that trust with my students. And like I said, they're honest with me. A student who's like, yeah, I'm, you know, before the semester started, I got the opportunity to get these tickets to go to a concert back home with some friends and family. I'm going to take one of my mental health days and go do that. And I'm like, you know what? You do you. Uh, some students have really difficult exams right after my class that they prepare for. A couple of students had some anatomy exam that they needed to prepare for and they were freaking out about it. And so they were like, can we take our mental health day today and just get ready for that exam? You know what? That's fine. So this was elf clear brow gel just to try to keep the hairs of my brow in place. Um, yeah, I think today probably do a fairly simple eye because I think I'm going to do a really ridiculous lip color today. Maybe purple. I don't know. We'll see how I'm feeling. But so I'm going to go in. This is one of the first palettes I ever got when I started to get into makeup, the Too Faced Chocolate Palette. This is just the original chocolate bar. It smells delicious. Uh, it's sort of like the Too Faced Peachy Matte Palette. Anything with a good scent is good by me. Um, if you are sensitive to smells, I might skip these though. Thinking about some things that my students have done recently, uh, we just went over the market revolution, I think last week or the week before. And one of the fun exercises we did in class is that my early American students created, uh, they either created a crossword puzzle related to the themes and uh, key terms from the chapter, or they created a soundtrack of songs past and present that they felt represented the themes of the market revolution the best. And if you're interested in those, I'll link you to my website below and I'll also provide the Spotify links to those because I thought that they did a phenomenal job. The students also, of course, had to explain to me why they chose the songs that they chose. But again, I thought they did a really great job. They were creative. I mean, obviously some of the songs were very obvious, like I've been working on the railroad or, you know, working man blues, but uh, some were a lot more, uh, a little more interesting, like Rihanna's Bitch Better Have My Money. Uh, that was a common song among all the different lists. So yeah, you'll have to go check those out. And while you're playing around on my website, you can also take a look at some of my other assignments to see what my students are doing. Uh, all of my classes, except for my research and writing class, do a final project. And I really, I've really loved the design of this project because I feel like it allows students a bit of creativity. They can bring in their passions or their interests. Uh, they can use their majors to their advantage uh, in order to create these final projects. I've had everything from digital marketing materials to drunk history videos, which I'm still hoping and praying the students weren't actually drunk in those videos. Students have done choreography uh, by researching the history of dance. They created their own choreography live tweets. I mean, you name it, students have done all sorts of amazing things. So I sort of highlight some of the, the more unique projects on my website, but there's so many great ones each semester that it's almost impossible to link to them all. Now that I'm trying to blog a little bit more, it's probable that I'll have a blog post at the end of the semester highlighting this semester's key projects. In particular, I'm excited to see what my pirate class comes up with. Uh, there's a lot of neat projects. I have a fashion uh, design major. She's researching the history of clothing during the time period and sort of what pirates might have worn versus how we portray them today. And while she's not going to have the time to create an actual article of clothing, although I hope she does eventually, she's going to uh, do some mock-ups, some sketches of outfits and what she thinks different nations, uh, different time periods, uh, what those pirates might have worn as they sail the high seas. I have another student, he's researching shanties. 
my hope is that he'll write his own shanties as part of that. Uh, I think that's also going to be an extra credit opportunity if a student writes their own shanty. Uh, then maybe I'll give them some extra credit. But for the most part, that class is very discussion based and I'm finding that it is incredibly effective. I hope it works just as well when I teach the women's history class at Stevenson for the first time and just trying to incentivize the reading. So in the pirate class, as part of their discussion readings, they earn gold coins. For every question they ask, they get two gold coins. And for every question they answer in class, they get one gold coin. And we are keeping a tally. And by the end of the semester, as the top three students with the most gold coins wins and they're good we're gonna have a pirate party at the very end it worked out pretty well last time and this doesn't just mean that students have to speak in class because i recognize that there are students who are supremely uncomfortable doing that and i'm not going to force them to do that but rather than punish those students just by not granting them coins they have the ability to send me stuff in advance questions in advance that i'll ask on their behalf to earn coins and while they're in class when questions are being asked, they can type up their responses and email those to me for additional credit. So I try to make sure everyone is included. And I have to say, discussion is always quite amazing. I almost never have to ask my own questions just because they're, they're just so good. They come up with these questions and, you know, yes, I have a, a large number of majors in the class. So I have sort of higher expectations from them, but I have a significant number of non-majors in the class who are doing a wonderful job. Uh, some of these students have taken classes with me before, so it's always wonderful to work with them again. And I think that's sort of one of the cool things about Stevenson is that because it's so small, if a student has the opportunity, they typically will take more than one class from me. And that's, you know, that's a good feeling too, because they made that conscious decision to take a second class with you. And I mean, of course that makes you feel good. I'm trying to figure out today, my survey students were talking about Andrew Jackson and the age of Jackson. So last class period, we were working with Thomas Jefferson's letter about the Missouri crisis and how that sort of set the tone for the political era to come and trying to just get them to understand the continuity of time. So many of them were like, holy crap, Thomas Jefferson's still alive. And it's like, yeah, we're going to be stuck in this time period for a while. And they did a really, really great job with that. I love using primary sources with students because I find that more often than not, they're way better at it than they even they realize but once they realize what they're doing uh, I think that for many of them and again in my survey levels most of those are not majors uh, once they realize what they're doing they get a sense of like pride almost that here I am like actually analyzing a historical document and most of them never thought that they would do that so that's a lot of fun I think next week we move into religion and reform, which is a really fascinating aspect of the time period. Uh, just the ways in which new religious factions emerge and we're going to be talking about the Shakers and the Oneida community and all the Transcendentalists. Tomorrow we have our History Forum. We're going to be talking about our spring course offerings. So I'm just going back into that palette and running some color under my eyes so that it looks a little more coherent. How do you guys enjoy my sweet, sweet background right now? So the person who lived here before was an older lady. From all accounts, she was a legitimate hoarder. So that's terrifying. But her family lives on the other side of the country from what I gathered. So I'm very concerned and confused by the Bambi motif in here. It's a very yellow room. There's lots of random holes in the wall. And 
I mean, whoever did that Bambi did a really good job. It's just, you know, just creepy. And so my husband and I have bought some paint, but we have not yet uh, been able to get that painted. Painting just takes so much more time than you think it would, especially when you have to prep the walls. So trying to work on two books, two book chapters, uh, teaching, uh, home repairs. Life is busy here. Twitter has done such amazing things in terms of my academic work. I've met some phenomenal people. Everybody who I've worked with has been just so open to helping. Kate Clary invited me to give a talk on my pirate research to uh, not just the university at Coastal Carolina, but to the local community, which I'm really excited about. Um, Ignacio Gallup invited me last year to give a talk at Bryn Mawr on my work, and it was so great to work with the students and talk to them about what I did. So, I, I mean, I couldn't be more grateful for the opportunities that social media have afforded me when it comes to academia. And it's something that sort of, I mean, I deal, and almost all academics, I think, to some degree, deal with some amount of imposter syndrome. But when you come from a blue collar background, if you're a first gen doc, I sometimes think that that imposter syndrome, especially being a woman, is just, it's magnified in a lot of ways. And these Twitter opportunities have really helped me uh, to feel a little bit better about the work that I'm doing, give me a little bit more confidence in my abilities. And right now, one of the book chapters that I'm working on is going to be co-authored with my colleague, uh, Carrie Spencer. Uh, I'll link her details below just so you can go follow her because she's awesome. But she has her PhD in literature and she teaches writing in the sciences at Stevenson University which is just such an interesting niche to work in. Uh, and so we right now are working on a chapter for a forthcoming edited collection called The Pedagogy of Harry Potter. And what we're doing is we're writing about first generation mentorship for students because I feel like there's a lot of faculty members who don't understand the first generation experience. And so they don't know how to mentor those students in comparison to mentoring students who maybe already have some of the tools needed to navigate the college experience. And we're using Harry Potter, the mentorship in Harry Potter, the good, the bad, and the toxic, uh, as a lens through which to view that. And Muggle-born students are going to be our lens for first generation students since a lot of the muggle born students in the series they'd be considered sort of first gen students because they come from non magical families uh, and you know maybe some of their parents were muggles who entered into Hogwarts but I feel like a lot of them did not especially Hermione of course being the prime example uh, but we're really excited about that. And then we just saw a call for papers for an open access journal looking at piracy in literature, like literature and pirates. And that just, I mean, I study pirates in history. Carrie does literature. So why not examine pirates in literature? So we're still trying to figure out exactly how we're going to navigate that. But if this book chapter goes well, I think we're going to throw our hat in the ring for that journal and see what happens. I really love collaborating. I think history needs more collaboration. Uh, too often I think it seems like we have to be a solo endeavor that we can't make solid contributions. I'm glad to see that I think for a lot of scholars that mentality is changing, but I'd like to see more of it. So if anybody wants to collaborate, let's let's make that happen. So I just put on my lashes, this is number seven Lash Impact Ultra. And I'm not gonna lie, I bought it because it's sparkly and pretty. But I also love the number seven company. 
and this one is also suitable for sensitive skin and although I don't know that I actually have sensitive skin I just enjoy making sure that nothing's going to irritate my skin all right so we are nearing the end of the makeup process when I'm not talking this doesn't normally take quite as long so we can see if I can edit it down a little bit but I think I want to go for a fun color today the question is which fun color well I have mermaid blood breakfast at Tiffany's is a possibility or you better work so I don't know I've, I've worn breakfast at Tiffany's before so let's let's throw that down uh, but let's see oh, mermaid blood or you better work hmm let's go with mermaid blood today why not now I'm just really feeling the mermaid blood Well, that is something else, isn't it? Now if I could just get my lips even, because they're not even, so. It's probably going to be as close as it's going to get. We'll go with it. That is a very, very bold lip. So. We're going to try to clean that up a little bit with some concealer. Uh, this is a tricky process, so be careful. So, last step, I'm going to throw some setting spray on. I think today, just for fun, we're going to use the Urban Decay All Nighter Pollution Protection. Uh, I loved the original all-nighter, so I decided to give this one a try. And I might go a little hard with the setting spray just because I am now in my 30s, which is fun to say. And my skin is not as youthful and amazing as it once was. So yeah, that completes today's video. Hopefully you enjoyed my long rambling introduction. Um, but this is the finished look. Uh, I am so in love with this color right now. It is probably absolutely ridiculous. I don't know how many academics are walking around with mermaid blood on their lips, but you know what? We're gonna make it happen. We're gonna make it work and we'll see what my students think today. But I just wanna thank you guys for joining me this morning. For those of you who have subscribed, thank you very much for your support. Uh, I really wanna thank the Twitter colleagues who encouraged me to do this for fun. I am not a beauty influencer. I am not a beauty YouTuber or anything like that. I just want to encourage others, especially academics, if you're into makeup, if you're into fashion, if you're into video games and young adult novels, whatever it is that you're into, and if anybody's ever made you feel like, whether explicitly or implicitly, that you're less of an academic, screw them. Because these are just other parts of yourself. Academia is a job, and it might be one of your passions, but I can guarantee you it's not your only passion. If you haven't already, Go ahead and hit that subscribe button, hit the notification bell if you're so inclined, and come back and join me. Let me know in the comments below what you'd like to see next. Uh, is there a particular look, sort of tutorial you'd like me to do? Is there a particular aspect of history you want me to talk about? Is there a book that you're really into that I should read? Just hit me up below and we'll see what the next video holds. So thank you guys so much for joining me and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.